This is episode 87 of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast, and I'm your host, John S. Today I'll have a conversation with Ernie P., who spoke at the 2018 Northeast Regional AA Service Assembly. The topic was, Is God a Requirement for AA Membership? Ernie will talk about his experience preparing for and delivering the talk, as well as the reaction he received. Hello, I'm here with Ernie P. from Hopakin, New Jersey, and we're going to talk about a panel that he recently participated in at now, to get, tell me if this is right, um, Ernie. Is it Northeast Regional Service Assembly of Alcoholics Anonymous? Yes, uh, North. Yes, Northeast Regional uh, Alcoholics Anonymous Service Assembly. Got it. Okay. And Narasa. Narasa. Okay. And you were uh, you participated in a panel all about um, agnostics and atheists in AA, and also you are a DCM for your district. Yes, uh, I serve as a DCM for District 9 in Area 44, which is North New Jersey. Okay. Well, why don't you uh, tell us about, about all of this? You know, how, how did this thing come up? How did you ever get involved in this uh, in, to begin with? <laughs> so uh, I, I definitely did not ask to be involved with it. <laughs> it was uh, kind of one of those things that um, somebody asked, and uh, I just ended up saying yes, and... It was quite an experience and an opportunity for growth that uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't know it before. And I, I mean, like maybe a couple months ago, um, I, I didn't know that I was going to look at look at it like that. I, I really just dreaded talking in front of all these people. Uh, there was a, a guy named Craig W. who was a past delegate in Connecticut. And Connecticut was hosting the service assembly. And um, they had six panels, different panels for different topics. And they put, he, he asked, well, he reached out and asked me if I would be interested in uh, doing a panel. And I found out the topic eventually was um, on Is God a Requirement for A Membership? And um, immediately I was like, oh boy, <laughs> this is, uh, this is going to be a controversial one. So um, I ended up getting to pick which subtopic I wanted when um, a, a individual that was on one of the um, committees for NARASA reached out to me and told me the three different subtopics for is God a requirement for a membership. And I chose the topic, well, are we inclusive or are we subtly divisive? So I ended up writing out kind of a report on um, what happened to the Toronto groups. Mm -hmm. And, and how the Greater Toronto Area Inner Group had delisted the We Agnostics group, and I believe there was another group. I forget. I forget yeah. what the other group's Beyond name. Belief. Yes, yes. Um, how they were delisted, and um, <clears throat> how Larry K had taken them to court with the Human Rights Tribunal mm -hmm. and filed a claim and won the lawsuit. I and I, I spoke also with uh, Greg T who's our general manager of GSO, and he said uh, that uh, he gave me a bit of a background. And AWS was never against them, and they, right. they, are, they also stated that we, we are um, not a religious organization. The only requirement is the desire to stop drinking. That's right. Um, I, yeah, I, I, AA World Services really was on Larry's side. And, right. you know, they were and so Larry released them because they were nothing but cooperative and helpful with uh, with his point there, because actually, you know, what the Toronto Intergroup did was absolutely insane. Um, their first defense was that um, in order to be a member of the Toronto um, Intergroup, you must believe in God <laughs> right. and practice the 12 steps as um, written or something like that. Right, which which is not the case. You do not have to adopt the twelve steps uh, at all. You can change whatever you want with the steps. That is not a requirement. Even so, to be a group, I do think that like if a group does change the steps, they should. I mean, this is just my personal thought, but if a group does change the steps, they should still say hey, these are not the actual um, published twelve steps and. 
you know, just to let people know. That way they know yeah. what the actual 12 steps are and they can go investigate them for themselves. But, and you know, uh, that's actually what those groups did. Um, they used to read before their meeting that the, that this is an adaptation, an adaption of the original 12 steps written in 1939. And, right. which, and interestingly enough, those alternative 12 steps were actually posted on the tr- the Greater Toronto Area Intergroup's website for a little while because what they did is uh, the Toronto Intergroup would have, you know, little places on their webpage for different groups and they had that up there um on the Toronto Intergroup's website for for for, right. for a little bit anyway. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, um so yeah, with the uh the 12 steps um I I personally carry around the Cleveland Ohio agnostic version of the 12 steps. I carry that around in my service books. Uh my my binders for my DCM position mm-hmm. and I've allowed numerous friends of mine that do believe in God to read these and they're just shocked at like they're like wow, I already do all this. Right. And, it's like that's there, that's because there's not really a difference. It's still self improvement. This is still me trying to get better, be better, be a yeah. better person. And, yeah, I, the only thing is God. The word God was removed out of the equation. That's really, it. Yeah, I know. It's really funny when you look at the steps, and you know, even the big book describes this as a practical program of action. And every single step has an action, you know, and it's something that we've either done or experienced. And so the belief part. Whatever empowers us to do those things is is pretty immaterial. You know, I might believe that it's, you know, God that empowers me and someone else might believe that it's the, the person sitting next to him in the room. So it doesn't right. really matter. It, it, we take the same action. You know, we do the right. same thing. So, yeah, I, I actually had a lady come up to me after I had given my presentation at Narasa and she was like, she's like, I don't understand why you're here. Like, why? why don't you guys just go start your own AA? Why don't you just break off, branch off, and go start your own AA as like an atheist agnostic AA? And I'm like, well, I, I number one, I don't think we're organized enough for that. No. And, and then I, I pointed out the fact. I said, look, I'm sure that you've worked the steps, right? And I'm sure that you've, you know, went through the book. And, um, I asked her, I said, do you follow the steps the exact way that Bill Wilson did? Because he's the one that, that, that wrote these. And this was his experience with staying sober and how he had stayed sober. And she told me no. And I said, well, neither do I. I just happen to follow them in my own way, just like you do. Mm-hmm. And I, I think she kind of like shut me out after that. And <laughs> that that was that was pretty much it for that conversation. But... You know, at the end of your talk, I was really surprised at some of the comments. And one of the comments was this guy read some warranty. And I'm not that familiar with the warranties. But he said something that like the warranty. Yeah, well, the warranty of AA is that you grow closer to God or whatever. And then he said, uh, if you go, guys want to go do your own thing, we invite you to, su- to succeed or whatever. Um, that was kind of weird. <laughs> You're right. What, what's that all about? Is there what I, I guess I could go get my service manual and read that, but is there a warranty yeah. like that? Um I personally would need to go look as well. I <laughs> I don't doubt him, but uh I that that brings up another point of um you know, what direction are we really headed? It's kind of contradicting. Yeah. You know, to me, that's kind of contradicting. So I know it's like he's basically saying, saying we are a religion. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah. so it's it, I'm hearing one thing and then I'm hearing another. So, yeah. And, and it's like, would you have me go drink because I don't believe in God? Is is my sobriety not really worth it because I don't believe in God? Good point. And then also, you know. Um, even the the guys who wrote the big book, they, they were religious as hell. But they said, um, if you're approaching somebody who isn't particularly religious, lay lay off the religious stuff. You know, don't don't really push that. You know, because <laughs> because you want to reach somebody from where they're at anyway. So, yes, yes, but, and then, and, then, and my uh, I guess going back to my uh, presentation, that was where I shared about. There's been controversy since the very beginning of AA with uh, Jim Burwell, H- Hank Parkhurst, and um, Bill Wilson was very. And I, I've heard, I've gathered this from some of your other podcasts and um, reading uh, key players in AA by Bob Kay, 
doing my own independent research online, but um, I, I, I seen where there's been like a lot of controversy from the very, very beginning where Bill Wilson wanted the steps written a certain way. And I, th- at some point in the steps where he had like on, on your knees for prayer and Jim, Bur- Jim Burwell and Henry Park or Hank Parkhurst were like, trying to push against that and the same with he just had the word god so they got him to add god as we understand him which really opened a path for other people of like non-christian faith to succeed in aa that's right and um that history just kind of points out you know how really uh, i don't know insulting it is for someone to say why don't you guys just leave and i'm like wait a second it's like telling me to leave my own house you know, we um, atheists um, are just as much a part of this fellowship and have done just as much to build it as anybody else. And, you know, Hank Parkhurst, you know, he didn't write. Well, he wrote um, the, the uh, chapter to the employers. So he did write right. that chapter. But he also was instrumental in, like, getting the big book published. He was promoting right. it, you know. Right. And with, that, with, with him, I, I, I know it would have been very, very hard. Just like uh without bill wilson writing what he wrote in the big book Mm -hmm. uh, i don't think without hank parkhurst that we would have had as much of an instrumental uh player in getting that out to the public yep i agree so you were um let's go back to your presentation again so um you were asked to do this thing you were asked to participate in this panel and um tell me about it you had how many people are out in the audience and and who was out in the audience oh boy (laughs) There, there, there was, um, I, I was initially told there would be about a thousand people and, um, ended up getting the count and finding out there was like closer to 1200 people mm-hmm. towards the end of the weekend. So I went to each panel, um, throughout the first two days, uh, Friday were, were the first three panels and, um, Saturday were the last three panels. And I've noticed, I noticed like as each panel went on, more and more people were there. So I'm a programmer. I see patterns. I, I just automatically knew that there were just going to be an outstanding number of people in the last panel. And of course there were. So that was like the most people. And I'm sure a lot of them had came to, uh, really hear about, uh, you know, is God a requirement for a membership? Because I, I found that some people really believe that God is a requirement for a wow. member. Yes. Yeah, I, I was quite frightened and I had a feeling that I was going to be attacked mm-hmm. by, by people afterwards, maybe chased out with like a pitchfork. Right. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, nobody chased me out with a pitchfork. Um, you know, some people did say some things which, uh, which was okay because uh, the way I see it is that uh, you know me being an atheist in AA for for the last seven years of my sobriety, um, we don't speak out as much because there's often times where people will cross share at us, uh, come up to us after the meeting, tell us in a condescending tone, "Keep coming, you'll get it eventually." And for me, what happened that day was that. The people that don't know that this goes on got to see that from the microphone. And if nothing else succeeded in my presentation, I'm happy at the very least that people got to see that this is some of the things that we go through. A lot. Yeah, you're absolutely right. People um, would not be aware until they actually, you know, hear it from somebody. And it is kind of surprising. I think, you know, actually, I went back to my home group at one time and people were almost like willfully ignorant of it. They, they didn't even want to believe that such a thing could happen in AA because I guess they personally haven't experienced something like that. But, you know, it's also very subtle. You know, you, you pointed out that subtle, that subtlety part, but it truly is like even the crosstalk is pretty subtle, but when you're on the receiving end of it, you, you know what they're getting at, you know, or being shared at, put it that way. That's right. what, that's what would happen to me. I would get shared at more than anything else. So they would let me say my piece. But after I shared, you know, people go around the room and it's like they don't just share their own experience. They absolutely have to contradict whatever it was that I just said. <laughs> right. And put kind of put me in my place. Right. Right. And um, I don't see a place for that either. Like. That that was kind of in my presentation where I shared about how when I take a sponsee through the book, I allow my sponsee to tell me what it means to them. 
Because they're the one that has to figure out their own path. I can't figure it out for them. Just like others couldn't figure out my path for me. The people that were saying, well, you need to find God. Well, that didn't work out for me too well. And I found my own path. And fortunately, there were individuals that allowed me to mm-hmm. find that. I have to do the same to believers and non-believers. Mm-hmm. So when I sponsor a guy, I have a couple of guys that uh, kind of teeter on the idea of having a higher power. But I allow them to have that experience because I'm really taking from them if I don't. I, I shared sure. that in my presentation that yeah. that's kind of how AA works. And that was the beauty of AA working in both of our lives. Yeah. So and, you had a lot of people in the audience that were actually on the general service board or um, uh, part on the board of um, AA World Services? Uh, yes, there were there were some staff from AAWS that were there. Uh, all the Northeast region delegates, DCMs, GSRs, committee chairs of uh, different committees, uh, trustees were there, trustees committee members, which are, I believe, uh, all different delegates that are assigned mm-hmm. to... Because when you become a delegate, I believe that you're assigned to a um, committee, right. which which you'll you'll be on before the general service conference to vote on topics. Right. And did you get any um, feedback from them about how they they felt the presentation went? From a few, most of them said thank you, thank you for going up there, thank you for your courage. Which uh, I I realized that it did take some courage, mm-hmm. even though. Just I was just going up there to share my message, and uh, I, I did realize that um, the dynamic of relationships I have with some people were going to change after this, too, because yeah. this isn't something that I just openly talk to about people, and now here I am exposing myself from the microphone, and it's being recorded, and people all across my northeast region that listen to this tape are going to hear this. Right. And um, But for the most part, most people were supportive. Most yes. people were very supportive. My, my delegate called me on Monday and he was like, hey, would you be interested in um, – sh- be- because we have a, a topic on adopting the God pamphlet or creating mm-hmm. some sort of uh, new literature for the atheist and agnostic. Mm-hmm. He's like, would you be interested in, um, in uh, I guess, sharing like a pros and cons presentation at the area assembly? I'm like, eh, no, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, – I, I have a baby coming next next month or this one, so it's, it's going to be kind of crammed, and I, I had to let them know that. But, uh, for the most part, there has been a lot of support from uh, a lot of people in my area that were past delegates, and uh, it's it's been a warm feeling, a really good feeling that I've had. Do you think it's because of the um, the the upcoming service conference and the the God Word and the atheist agnostic pamphlet being on the agenda? Do you think that's partly why they had the panel? Yes, um, from my understanding, they they usually try to pick panels based off of what the topics are going to be in mm-hmm. line with. So um, yes, that that would be the reason why. That's going to be interesting to see what happens with that. Is it like an either or thing where they either do the God Word? Or they do the other pamphlet, or could it be both? I think they're probably going to do either or. I don't. Yeah, that makes sense. Probably it's, just from a financial uh, standpoint. Yeah, and that's if if we get it as well. I I'm hoping so. What's your feeling on that? How's it look out there? There, there. Like I said, there was an overwhelming amount of support that I got, but mm-hmm. there were also quite a few people that didn't like what I had to say. Yeah. So. This is this is a very controversial topic in AA, and um, people are very strongly opinionated on it from either side. The so. thing that gets me about it is, you know, I guess I shouldn't be surprised by this. Um, you know, I always think about, oh, you know, regional differences within the United States or North America, and you think, okay, this this part of the country, they're going to be very much more open-minded towards uh, an atheist in AA, and another part of the country is going to be less open-minded. And you would think that here in Missouri that, that people would be pretty close-minded to the idea. But at our last area assembly, we had a, an excellent presentation. I wish I had a recording of it, but we had a presentation on um, safety in AA, and one of the topics of safety was um, religious religious harassment. 
And there was, and I didn't even know this, this young woman who gave the presentation, but she did an excellent job. And she talked about how people who um, are atheists or agnostics are sometimes harassed in AA in very subtle ways sometimes. But she went, she went all the way through that and the audience was very accepting of it. And then when it comes to the God word, um, our delegate thinks it's a great idea (laughs) and it doesn't seem to be controversial at all amongst the, amongst the uh, other people at the assembly. Um, and, and I never hear any, anybody, you know, saying anything against it. But then at the Northeast, um, regional service assembly, there were a lot of people speaking out about it, but maybe those were just the minority people, but they just had the loudest voices. Right. Right. It, they, what I noticed was a lot of, uh, the people that were displeased with what I was saying were the first ones getting up. It, it was like, they focused, they hyper focused on something I said, and they're like, "Oh no, that's it!" And then they're up at the mic, and I, I think they missed the rest rest of my message. Um, we don't care to sit there and change all the text of AA. We're just trying to change something that works for us. Like uh, when I change something in the book, or I change the steps to a way that I understand, that doesn't mean that I want to change all of AA. And I I don't think that's the answer. Because then you're going from one extreme to another extreme. Right. If, I, if I'm if i on some mission to take God out of everything, then I personally feel that I'm just as bad as the person that's trying to shove God down my throat. Right. There should be a way, in my opinion, of moving forward where you respect the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, how we grew up from the Oxford movement and respecting all the contributions of those people who do believe in God and respecting those people who are in the program today who whose faith is very important to them. But there sh- it should be, in my opinion, everything that we do in our literature should um, encompass everybody. So it should be, for those of us who have faith in God, you know, this is our experience. And for those of us who don't, this is our experience. To, so that it's not just one way. You know, and that was that was a bit of a, a problem, I think, with the big book is that they did their very best to to be um, inclusive. Right. But they right. but I think that they really, really believed in this in this um, experience that they had. And they really and, and they were stressing that God was all important. And the week chapter to the agnostics was really badly written about trying to convince us to convert. And unfortunately, right. they just kind of they kind of missed the mark. But we can correct that now. I think we can go by and say, I'm not saying change the big book. Leave it as it is. It's great. It's yeah. just, that's where we yeah. started. But, you know, right. going forward, what we write today should reflect, you know, what we've learned since that time. Sure, sure. I agree. And I mean, we're, we're starting out with very small strides. That I, I think, what, a couple of years ago, we had the Atheist and Agnostic compilation of existing stories in Grapevine. So that was, we're still waiting on that to be published, I think, but... That will be published this year. Okay. Yeah, that's going to be published. Well, I don't know if it's going to be in 2018, but but it's going to be, they've got approval. I think it's going to be 2018 or maybe early 2019, but they are definitely, yeah, that's, I think that's one of their next books they're going to be putting out. Right. And and from my understanding, uh, Grapevine didn't have to ask for permission to do that, but they chose to go ahead and send it to the general service conference and see um, what people felt as an overall topic. And it seemed like people were very uh, accepting for the vast majority of, of that topic. And like I said, this is very small strides. So I'm hoping that the same thing's going to happen with creating some sort of pamphlet for us, or yeah. at least at the very least adopting the God word pamphlet. Or, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that Godward pamphlet is is really pretty benign too. I mean, uh, when my delegate read it, she thought, "Oh, this is great." I mean, honestly, when you when you read it, it's like, "Oh, these people are pretty much having the same experiences as anyone else," and that's pretty much the truth anyway. Our experience is pretty much the same. It's just the way that we describe it or explain it is the only thing that's different between us and someone who believes in God. Everything else is pretty much the same. So that's why I think people are, would be surprised when they read it that the only difference is the belief factor is the only, only difference. Right. And, and the, the reason to me like why this is so important is because when I had about four years sober, all I kept hearing was you need God to get sober. Um, you know, here I was filled with resentments i didn't know how to let go of them and 
you know, I, I kept hearing God, 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 God. And I'm like, I just can't get with it. I tried, you know, I, I tried the whole prayer. I tried praying. But it, nothing was working for me. And it's just because it doesn't make sense to me in my mind. And it's not something that personally works for me. And I stumbled across your podcast because I decided instead of relapsing to start researching and find if there were other alcoholics out there like me because you don't see very many atheists in AA because they don't speak out because they don't want to get attacked. So there you have people like me that are misguided and they don't know what to do and they don't know what direction to head into. And I stumbled across your podcast. You maybe had like 12 or 13 out at the time and they really helped me. And that was when I had reached out to you three years ago and it really helped me and kind of created a foundation for me. And now I'm starting to see like what direction I want to go in sobriety. And this is important to me that something like this gets released because there's other people out there that are just like me that don't know what to do and they don't have other atheists or agnostics around to really talk to. And if there's some sort of literature that they can read at and it lets them know, hey, it's okay to be like this and you can make it because I made it too. It's really important to me that that gets out there to those people. I agree. And I also think it's good for us to, to be speaking openly in our meetings and at area assemblies and at service assemblies because it kind of hopefully will disarm people um, a little bit and maybe put them at ease that they'll understand that we're not really trying to change everything or um, here's the, the, the most the funniest comment I found from the um, people who spoke after your presentation was the guy who said that he was afraid that there that um, the believers were going to be run out of the <laughs> Right. right. Yeah, he spoke with passion. <laughs> yeah. He like he went to that thing because he knew he was going to get mad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He uh, he he seemed quite angry. <laughs> yeah. But hopefully uh, in time, you know, he'll realize because because he'll now that he knows that you're there and that, that all of us are out here, uh, maybe over time, you know, he'll settle down. He'll say, oh, I see. These guys really aren't that different. They're they're not going to throw me out. They're not trying to, ch you know, to to change everything. Um, right. So well, here's, here's the generational thing that, that, that one girl had spoke about. Mm. She said, said us, all us who are under 45, yep. you need us. You need us to keep AA running. You know, I, I have to agree with her and we're, we're going to have to be more accepting because, you know, that generation is eventually going to, I guess fade out because you know, that's just kind of what happens in life. Uh, we we get old, we pass away. We die. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, right, we do. Um, what's going to be left as your legacy? You know. What I mean? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, yeah, and, you know. Here's something kind of ironic too: is you know, Bill and Bob, they knew that too. They knew that they weren't going to be around forever, and they wanted. Um, they wanted to make sure that the fellowship survived. So they gave AA to the groups. And that's, right. how, you know, obviously how the whole service um, structure um, was started up. Um, so they, they knew this. And but I don't think that they were expecting that future generations would would cling so closely to their words from the 1930s, you know. So, yeah. It's very interesting too that 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 demographic from you know forty five and and younger these are the people that are showing up in AA now you know people that start having problems with their drinking in their twenties or thirties forties are showing up mm -hmm. in AA and this is a demographic that is much less religious uh, than the baby boomer generation and they are much further removed from that language of the nineteen thirties. Right. Um, they are much less likely to accept the patri the patriarchal language. Um, you know, it's like in my generation, you know, I, 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 you know, I learned how to read in the, um, what, the late 1960s. Okay. So I, I, you know, it, there was a lot of sexist language. There was a lot of, there was a lot of ridiculous stuff out there. So, you know, as I was growing up in the seventies and the eighties, um, as I would read this stuff, you know, I could somehow realize, okay, that's, that's the way it was. But you have somebody now who, you know, was born 20 or 30 years ago. They're not accustomed to reading crap like that. And then when, if they read our, our material, you know, from the big book 19th, you would think that that would be kind of 
totally foreign to them. Right. You know? <laughs> Which is why when I take my sponsees through the big book, I actually have something called the little big book dictionary. And we will, we will go at uh, frequent times. They're like, what's that mean? And I'm like, Oh, well, let's go look it up. And yeah. we, we go look it up and <laughs> figure out what it means. Yeah. yeah the, language is very different so anyway but you know you would think from some of the comments that um that that there were a lot of people that were opposed but you you think uh, overall you got like a standing ovation so when I, when i finished with my speech i just kind of looked down and uh pulled a napoleon dynamite and just kind of went off uh from the microphone straight to my chair and uh didn't really look back up but my best friend who was sitting in the audience told me that some of the people at the front had actually stood up and gave me a standing ovation. Ah, uh, isn't that nice? Yeah, I thought that was that was really cool. Um, so the vast majority of the people there, they, they appreciated what you had to say, you know. And so that that's something to think about, I think, positively. Yeah, it, it, uh, it felt good to be done with. It's definitely something that has uh, challenged me to grow. And I actually, I thanked Craig at the end. I said, thank you. Uh, for asking me to do this because it, it really challenged me to step out of my comfort zone of hiding where a lot of times I won't even share at meetings mm -hmm. to go share about, you know, my beliefs and how I stay sober in front of 1,200 people and it will continue to be listened to by whomever. So mm -hmm. it it really was a, a big opportunity for growth for me. That's great. So do you think you're going to be able to do the thing at the area assembly? Yeah, uh, I didn't even get nervous when I was asked. Okay. Yeah, the assembly, like, I was just nervous the entire time. Like, I would just think about it and my heart would start racing. You know, the funny thing is, is like they say, like, the worst things happen to you in your head. Like, actually, every time I thought about giving the speech, it was so much worse in my head than when I was actually up there uh, presenting. So, so Well, you I, did such a great job, and it was really cool how you did the... Um, you you listed your sources at the end. Yes. And really great. Larry Kay, you got to talk to Larry. Yes, he he was very nice, very helpful guy. He knew that he knew that topic pretty well. Then you also spoke with uh the general manager of the general service office. Yes. Yes, I did. I I actually wish I could have uh shared more on the topic because it it was very important and I thought that it needed so much more than I was actually able to share in the 10 minute time frame. Yeah. It's well, incredible that you were able to get to be so concise and thorough in what you had to say you, you put in, I thought it was just a perfect presentation because you put in exactly, I think what people needed to hear in the time that you had to do it. You made a really good use of your time in my opinion. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, th there were a lot of times in my head where I'm like, why am I the one being like, <laughs> being asked to do this? Like, why did, why did he ask me? But because I, I was, I was going to do everything I could to make it the best because cool. this was important to me. And now I know that's why I was asked to do it. Well, you did a great job. And thank you very much for uh, sharing your experience with us here on the podcast. That was really thank nice of you. It's been fun talking to you. I appreciate it. And, and stay I, in touch. I make back out to Missouri sometime to one of your meetings. Oh, please do. That'd be fun to have you out here. My my mom's out in St. Joe. and Oh, that, that's, that's right. Where, I remember yeah, that. That's where I'm from. I was born out in Maryville. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. Do you ever get uh, out here? Maybe every couple of years or so. I usually fly into Kansas City Airport and she'll pick me up. So, uh, yeah, cool. maybe one day I'll have to have you pick me up. Absolutely. Please call next time you come out here. I definitely will. Thank you. All right, you too. Well, that's it for another episode of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. Thank you for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed recording it and speaking with Ernie. What a great guy he is. Be sure to check out some of the links that we'll post with the podcast. You'll be able to listen to the audio of the panel Ernie participated in when he gave his talk at the Northeast Regional AA Service Assembly. Next week, we'll be speaking with Life J, who's coming to us from beautiful Northern California. So please be sure to tune in for that. Until then, you all take care, be well. We'll speak again soon.